Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful people and kindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be made, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Amen. Amen. That's an ecumenical prayer. Uh, all right. Here is the shorn lamb uh, being led to the slaughter. Uh, welcome, welcome to our office here. Uh, and uh, I learned that you have you you've prepared questions. I'm not promising I'm going to answer answer them, but uh, I'll I'll have a shot at it. Uh, because I'm sure you know a great deal about South Africa. You would have prepared, you would have been told uh, a great deal about the colonial period, apartheid period, and all of that kind of thing. And, and so uh, I'm, I'm as ready as I possibly can be. Yes. My name is Jack, and um, I have a question about the post-apartheid period. Um, my question is, we've seen these pictures and heard these stories of this um, extreme sense of like bliss after apartheid was ended. My question to you is, did, was the end of apartheid just like one step in a process you had been planning? Or was it kind of like it ended and all of a sudden you had to kind of go, oh, like what next? Like, where do I, what's my next step? Mm -hmm. Yes, I... I would have expected that we obviously said, I mean, yes, it was an epoch that ended um, and uh, we were looking for a new kind of society. Uh, the previous one had been marked by uh, separation discrimination, racism, uh, and we, 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 we said we wanted a, a new kind of society which would be non-racial. Um, these are all sort of cliches, yes, non-racial, uh, non-sexist, um, and we 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 hoped, I mean, that we would have a society that uh, uh, celebrated its diversity, and and and, and we you'll see frequently refer references to the rainbow nation, uh, where we said, I mean, a rainbow is is a rainbow precisely because it has got different colors. They don't merge into each other. They 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 are different and yet they coalesce. Um, and yeah, I, I, I think too, I mean, that uh, we, we had, unreal, I, should, I should think, I mean, most of us probably had unrealistic expectations um, of the post-apartheid period. Um, where we thought that um, the idealism that characterized the anti-apartheid period, the struggle period, uh, the you know the high ideals, the altruism, where people were involved in the struggle, uh, not for what they would get out of it. Uh, we thought that those automatically transferred to the post-apartheid period and, and clearly uh, we were wrong. Um, I sometimes say at, at, at least it showed that uh, we, are, we are human. <laughs> that uh, um, uh, so-called original sin does not know any uh, racial discrimination. We we are all we are all afflicted by original sin. People succumbing to temptations uh, to do and to be like many of the things that they had opposed in the apartheid period. 
And uh, as you've seen, I mean, uh, the stark uh, differences and, and, and uh, you know, cheek by jowl, we have very wealthy and very, very poor. We, there, there are levels of poverty in our country that are totally unacceptable. I mean, there are people who go to bed hungry, um, and that, that's unconscionable. Um, I could go on, but I mean, uh, maybe we give a, a, a chance to other people. Uh, you will have, you'll see that I used to be a teacher, and, and as, as, a, as, as a teacher, you, you, in order not to have too many questions, you stretch your answers, you know. <laughs> But I, I won't do that. I'll let you. I will we'll try and, and take as many questions as possible because I think you, 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 you deserve it. I, I learned uh, uh, Ingrid Leroux, who is, who is our family physician, um, was very deeply impressed with yourselves. And she told me uh, this morning when we were at coffee that uh, you. You went out to clean windows and cut grass and and paint. Uh, thank you very much, uh, 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 Pilani. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have a question. Yeah. My name is Erin. Um, you wrote in one of your books that God has a soft spot for sinners. If God is so forgiving, what gives a person incentive to change? Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, hey, how old are you? I'm 17. Ah, then you must have a boyfriend. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, why, why I'm saying that is, uh, the, the point is, when, when you're in love, uh, you strive to do the things that will please your lover. Uh, and the way God operates uh, is, 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 is the, on the basis of love. God is trying to uh, sort of move us into a love affair with God. I mean, we, the way sometimes we preach, we, we, we make out that God is, is, is waiting eagerly to catch us out. It's, it's not that way at all. I mean, it's ex extraordinary because it almost is as if God, in fact, wills us also to sin. But that's not true. The, the thing is God, God has been incredible in, in creating us to be persons. God could have created us to be automatons who were always choosing the right side, I mean, making the right decision. But it was an incredible thing that God said, I want, I want, I want persons uh, who therefore have freedom, it's a real freedom, although obviously, I mean, it is, it is a freedom uh, that I mean, we are given an autonomy, and a real autonomy, and, 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 and God would much rather we went freely to hell than compel us to go to heaven. And, 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 the, and the way is that God says, I, this is what I would love you to be, to be. This is what I would love you to be. But I'm not going to constrain you. I want it to be your choice and and it's a fantastic thing because even at the moment when i am making the choice to reject god i who depend from moment to moment you you know there there's a, that a beautiful image of god creating by breathing god's breath into into this lump of clay, making it a human being. It's, it's not like God, you know, when you have a balloon, 
you can blow the balloon up, inflate it, and then you can tie it, and, and, and the air remains and the balloon. No. It's, it's a fantastic thing that from moment to the next moment, if God were to have stopped for a split second, you would, we would disintegrate into nothingness. And, and, and the, the, the incredible thing is, is that God breathes this breath and keeps each of us in existence, in being, even when we choose to reject God. Now, if I had the power, the kind of power, I would, I would snuff you out. But God doesn't. And, 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 you know, I mean, God says, I have given you this gift, and it is a real gift. I want you to love me freely. And I will do anything, anything, up to giving up the most precious thing I could say I have, my son, to prove I love you. And please come back. So when, when God invests in the sinner, as in the story of the hundred sheep and, and, and the lost sheep. I mean, we, 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 get, we miss the point of that story because in most, I mean, if you go to church, most churches, when they have images of the good shepherd, they show Jesus carrying a nice fluffy lamb. Now, now fluffy little lambs don't, don't stray from their mummies. The, the sheep that sh will stray is the most obstreperous, troublesome one. Mm -hmm. And the point of the story is God is prepared to leave 99 perfectly well-behaved sheep <laughs> to go and look for this one. And you remember that this, they say, not there is great joy, they say there is greater joy in heaven over this one than over the 99. Uh, and and, and to, so to answer your question, which is the whole gospel, I mean, you know, really, it is that God hopes that I, we are going to love God back, that our lives are lives that are uh, a, a response to a love that we already have received. Most of us tend to be, you know, I mean, we, our, our, our parents will maybe sometimes, when, when they are upset with us and we've been, we've been troublesome, say something like, mommy really doesn't like a naughty child. And we think that we have to earn the approval, earn the love of our parents. And then we transfer it to God and think we have to earn. We don't have to earn it. God loves us. I mean, there's an incredible thing in, 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 in the prophet Jeremiah way. Jeremiah is scared of becoming a prophet, and God says to him, before, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. That is, each one of us is not a divine afterthought. Incredible, I mean, you know, really, to, to think that God loved me before I actually was. Uh, that I'm not an afterthought, I'm not an accident. You aren't an afterthought, you're not an accident. Some of us might look like accidents, but I mean, uh, uh, none of us is in fact an accident. And so, 
I invest and hope that you will be, you will say, ah, this is my lover and I want to please my lover. Right? Yes, ma'am. I'm Haley. Um, personally, forgiveness has been challenging for me, especially when I feel like the other person that has hurt me isn't being punished in a certain way. So my question is, during the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, how were people able to let go of their anger and forgive when, w without feeling like a punishment was needed? Yes. Forgiving is, is not easy. You know, I mean, it's not, <laughs> it's not cheap. And, and those of us who claim to be Christians get to remember, I mean, that forgiveness cost God the death of God's son. It's, it's a very expensive thing in, in many ways. Uh, but you see, one of the things that we, we try to tell people is that there are two, at least two forms of justice. There is what is called retributive justice and there is restorative justice. Retributive justice is one that says, clobber him or clobber her because they clobbered me. Uh, and, and so it, 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 it emphasizes punishment. Uh, ret restorative justice says, no, the offense affected a relationship. And what you will, what you are seeking for is to restore the relationship, to heal the relationship. Because you see, if you, you say, you, you think sometimes that maybe if, if the person who hurt you is clobbered, you, you, you feel a little better. But it actually doesn't say, let's, let's take an extreme example. Supposing it is somebody who killed your mom, all right? And as, you, as happens, uh, your country still believes in um, capital punishment, one of the greatest obscenities uh, in, in the world, but never mind. Uh, it, 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 that's, another, that's another story. Does taking the life of the perpetrator return your mom? Uh, and, and, and then you ask, when, when is it that you can say, yes, we've had enough, it, it's enough revenge, and, and I think now we have uh, uh, restored the, the equilibrium. You, you never, it never happens. Um, and, and we also say, you know, that uh, revenge has a way of corroding you, the revenger. You know, it, it doesn't heal you. Um, and it is tough, but I mean, People were incredible, and, and people, it's not, it's, not, it's not a peculiarly African thing. In, in, in the TRC, one, one of the, the stories that we have is of somebody called Amy Beal. You've heard of Amy Beal? Amy Beal was a Fulbright uh, scholar who came to uh, a university here called the University of the Western Cape. Uh, and one day she gave a lift to one of her 
of a new colleagues at the university who, are, who, who lived in one of the townships here. Um, a, a, she was a black, black colleague. And they drove into the township, uh, and it was, it was during the uh, times of the uprisings and uh, turmoil. Uh, and, and there was a, there's, there's a particular political group uh, that used to say, one settler, one bullet. Uh, and Amy, Amy Peel drove into the township and there, were, there, was a, there, were, there was a mob of young people belonging to this group and they saw Amy Peel and um, they um, ended up killing her. You know, she, she stopped the car, tried to run, um, she fell and the stone, I mean, she, she, she was killed quite gruesomely. Um, her parents came, I mean, they found two of the uh, sort of the leaders of that mob and who were sentenced to long terms of imprisonment. Though these, these guys then applied for amnesty and um, uh, Amy Beale's parents, her, her father has since died, but they came uh, to South Africa and said they supported the granting of amnesty to the, to the people who had killed their, their daughter so gruesomely. And they have now set up the Amy Beale Foundation um, in, in here and one of the things it's done is they, they started a bakery and all kinds of other projects and, and at least one of the, 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 the people they employed was one of the two guys who killed their daughter. Um, so I was going to say, you don't think that we, we, we have a, uh, a, a copyright to forgiveness. Uh, it, it's done by, by people everywhere. Um, and I hope, I mean, that you would be one of those who says, um, I, the person who has hurt me, and, and we mustn't pretend, I mean, that they haven't um, hurt you. But if you do not forgive, you actually uh, are tying yourself to the perpetrator. Um, but you are going to live your life as a victim, you know, and you will, you will not be, you won't experience a liberation, the liberation that comes actually from, 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 from forgiving. Yes, all right. Let's go. Yes. So, it seems to me that through your dedication to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that you have a very deep faith in humankind. And so I was just wondering how that came about and if you've ever doubted it. Yes. I, I have to say that, I mean, actually I have very little to do with, I had very little to do with the setting up of the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, I just had the great privilege of being, of being invited to become its chair. It was other people who, who had done marvelous work uh, long before the end of apartheid who said, what are we going to do post-apartheid? Uh, and uh, they looked at various uh, models. Um, yes, but I think all of us were, who were involved in the Truth and Reconciliation Committee realized, I mean, that we, we were being asked to participate in, in, in a process that was, well, quasi-legal, but uh, deeply spiritual. Uh, forgiveness is not 
generally something that you 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 find as a, as a as, as a coin uh, uh, being used by politicians. Um, it is most people would admit that it was something spiritual. Uh, people would say main, most, mostly that they would have been in, in influenced by whatever faith they have. It's a religious, religious um, uh, category, um, and and before we started, and and we were there were Christians, there were Jews, there were Muslims. Um, and there must have been people who who were maybe atheists or humanists or non-believers. Um, but uh, I, I, I said that uh, before we began our proceedings, we should uh, we should have a. a a silent retreat, and uh, we had we had a day when we went off as the commissioners, um, and and had someone um, very sensitively conduct uh, the retreat, and and also um, it was accepted too that when we had meetings of the commission. We would stop uh, at midday for a time of um, reflection, uh, and I would invite some, one of us, uh, maybe a Muslim, maybe a Hindu, maybe a Christian, uh, at the end to uh, to collect our our prayers, uh, and and so we would pray. And, and generally, I mean, when we had a hearing uh, for victims who were coming to tell their story, um, it, it was, well, most people in our country would have been surprised if we had not begun with uh, hymns and, and, and prayers. Um, so. There was a great deal of the spiritual. And when we finished our work, uh, we went to Robben Island and, and had another retreat there. We had a, a day, uh, a silent retreat. I mean, we went into the, uh, the cells, the former cells, and, and we just thought that, I mean, it, it was appropriate to to end um, end this enterprise with with a with a with a retreat and and our last meeting was held uh, or, uh, or on Robben Island uh, and I had also uh, uh, invited the monks and nuns of the Anglican Church around the world uh, to sustain us uh, in, in with their prayers. Um, yes, and you have to, you, you have to say, I mean, that uh, we have faith in, in humankind, um, that um, human beings are fundamentally good. And that's something that surprised me in a way uh, that what I took away at the end of the process, three years or so later down the line, uh, I mean, after we'd been exposed to some of the most awful uh, atrocities, um, people telling us some of the things that they'd done, um, And you were quite devastated by 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 the accounts that they gave. Um, I thought that that was what one would take away this feeling of just how uh, depraved we can be. Um, 
But I was, I was surprised that that wasn't what one took away. What one took away was uh, also a knowledge that, yes, we have an incredible capacity for the worst possible evil, all of us. Um, it was that we also have this incredible capacity for good. Um, and that is actually why we, we are all of us appalled when something bad happens. Because if, if, if the bad was the norm, we would just shrug our shoulders and say, well, tough luck. Um, this is how the, the, the cookie crumbles kind of thing. Uh, but none of us does that. I mean, when, when we hear a story, say, of the abuse of a child or the abuse of women, uh, almost all people um, are appalled by instances of that kind. Um, and, and I mean, even the worst dictator, there's not a single one of them who would say, oh yes, I, I violate human rights. They all claim, I mean, no, 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 we respect human rights. I mean, you know, I mean even when they are doing the most egregious things, um, uh, because it is that we are fundamentally good, you know. Uh, and, 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 and evil is an aberration. Uh, and, 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 and you see, too, with the, with the kind of people we revere, not just admire. You, you, you know, I mean, when you think, most, most people would say, ah, Mahatma Gandhi, yes, oh, what a wonderful man. Uh, Mother Teresa, uh, oh, uh, maybe Martin Luther King Jr., uh, Nelson Mandela, Dalai Lama, you know, and, and when you look at those people, it's not, it's not the macho, uh, aggressive, successful people. I mean, we, we may, we may envy them, their bank balances and kind of thing, yes, uh, for, for being successful, but we do not revere them. Uh, I mean, Mother Teresa, I mean, you could say many things about her, but she, certainly you wouldn't say she was macho. I mean, <laughs> anything but. Um, and, and why? I mean, it is that... Uh, you must have heard I mean, about uh, this African saint, one of the greatest uh, minds of the early church, Saint Augustine of Hippo, uh, that he, he said uh, about God, thou hast, thou hast made us for thyself, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. That we, we, we were an extraordinary uh, paradox. We are finite creatures made for the infinite. That, that, uh, uh, incredible. I mean, you know, and people come, come a cropper each time. I mean, some might say, well, I want to be successful uh, and maybe very rich. And they discover that if they turn that, as it were, into their God, it turns into dust and ashes. It doesn't actually uh, give them the contentment, the satisfaction they thought they would get. Um, sex or drugs or whatever. Uh, because we are we are incredible. We, we, are, we are, were made, were made by God, were made like God, were made for God. Uh, uh, incredible creatures, I mean, you know, incredible creatures. Yes, yes. Rachel. Okay.
<laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you. Mm. So yesterday, our group traveled to the township in Kailicha yeah. to visit the Falani Child Health and Nutrition Project. Mm -hmm. And while we were there, an outreach worker took some of us into the township and into the homes of the people who live there. And she informed us that many of the people who live in Kailicha are living there because that's where they were put during the apartheid. And I was just wondering if you ever feel a sense of failure because you worked so hard to end apartheid and people are still living in the same conditions that they were living in during apartheid. Yes. Yeah. I wish that we, we, we did have a magic wand, you know, uh, which we could uh, wave and, hey presto, magic. I mean, uh, uh, unfortunately, life is not like that, I mean, unfortunately. Uh, a paradigm that we use, uh, we used quite a lot was speaking about the Exodus. We said, God, God is on the side of the oppressed and God will, as God showed um, when God sided with a bunch of slaves, uh, God would uh, come down and uh, lead us out of bondage and God led us out of bondage. We, most of us, have made the mistake of forgetting that after they crossed the Red Sea, they spent 40 years in the wilderness uh, fighting amongst each other. I mean, if you read the, if you read the accounts, they were constantly bickering. They, they, there were some who then said, uh, I mean, it, it gave us the, the English expression, uh, the flesh pots of Egypt. There were those who longed and said, no man, uh, freedom, freedom is too demanding. Uh, we, want, we want to go back to Egypt. Uh, we, were, we were well fed there. Uh, I mean, we're tired of this uh, manna. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, God, can't you change the diet, man? I mean, you, please, please just change the, the menu on your... No, 40 years you are going to eat this, <laughs> this stuff. Um, and sometimes you'll get birds also, yeah. Uh, <laughs> And then, after 40 years, some who had left Egypt crossed the Jordan into the Promised Land. And we, we need to keep being reminded that uh, uh, if we are following that paradigm, uh, being formed into a nation uh, takes some doing. And you've seen, I mean, your own country, you've seen, uh, after Katrina, you realize, I mean, just what fissures there are in, in American society. And you've been free, what, more than 300 years. Uh, give us, give us a chance. <laughs> but no, I mean, it's a very important question. And I think, one of the things that has always surprised me is, is why the people are so patient. You know, because they've seen not just that freedom has come, what they've seen is that there are some who used to be poor, who are very rich, stinking rich, some of them. Um, and they still live in, in shacks um, or RDP houses, which are awful, actually. Uh, there are um, improvements. I mean, you drive along the N2 and you see on the left, when you're going to the airport, on the left, 
is the, that N, N, uh, N2 um, complex. But when you come away from the airport on the left, it's all of those uh, shacks. When, when a fire starts in one, it, it just races through, you know. Uh, and, and that's, in a, in a way, unconscionable, you know. Uh, but, well, I mean, I think we're beginning to see some of the, the dissatisfaction with people uh, going on uh, demonstrations, uh, they, they were they were stoning cars and, and things of that kind on the N2 uh, because they are feeling they are the left behinds. Uh, and uh, well, we have to be very careful that we, we give people the hope that uh, uh, freedom actually is better than unfreedom. That, uh, and, and I mean, they may question this, you know, because they, they could say, under apartheid, because of the very strict laws, you know, part of the problem is, you see, apartheid had a very uh, strict, um, they call it influx control. They kept most black people out of the towns uh, with 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 their past law system. When freedom came, uh, that that barrier was lifted, and and people rushed as they do everywhere in the world. I mean, people almost always imagine that life is going to be better in town, uh, and and that. Uh, the streets of the town are paved with gold, and, and so people come. Uh, they come, and and there's no adequate provision for them. Uh, and and yeah, I I mean I I think we've got to put uh, fire under the feet of uh, all kinds of people. Yeah. Mm. Are, are you still uh, eager to ask about? Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, uh, we named our project Project Ubuntu because we're searching for a true meaning of community yeah. and trying to explore our relatedness to others. And in trying to define the concept, we've discovered that it's very large and very multidimensional. So what I want to know is how did you come to your interpretation of Ubuntu? Because it seems like there are many different interpretations. And has what you see as Ubuntu changed over the years? It's not really my interpretation. Uh, I think that m most of us would, would say that Ubuntu basically it speaks about what it means to be human. Um, and what it means to be human is you are not meant to be grasping. Uh, it, it speaks about sharing. It speaks about being compassionate. It, it speaks about knowing that uh, we are interconnected uh, and, and, and that when when the humanity of someone is uh, undermined. I mean, whether I like it or not, mine is undermined as well. I, I'm, I'm less than what I would be. Uh, had it not happened, I would have been a far better play person. And, 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 and that's not theory, just not theory. I mean, you, you, you heard here in, in, in the TRC, you heard uh, how people did some quite dehumanizing things, and, and they thought it would hit as the victim, 
um, and 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 they they were shocked to find that it actually uh, I mean was was like a um, boomerang, you know, you throw it over there, it comes back to hit you, uh, like. You know, some some would say we 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 gave him drugged coffee and shot shot him in the head, and uh, and and then we burnt his body. Uh, and whilst his body was burning, it takes about nine or so hours for a human body to burn completely. Now you can't actually credit that. People could do what these guys said they had done, which was that whilst this body was burning, they were having a barbecue. You know, um, but then it is that when you pull down someone uh, inexorably. You find you have to join them in the gutter. I mean, to keep them in the gutter, you join them there, um, and and it is it is just for real. I mean that you see it too. You see it when when you do something good. Uh, uh, let's say I mean like you guys did uh, uh, at Pilani. Uh, sweeping and painting and and cutting grass. Yeah, you're doing it for them. But there is a spin-off for you, even even just the spin-off of feeling good. That it it, it does something for you. Um, that. Uh, uh, I mean, it's like forgiving. When when you nurse a grudge, it's not good for your health. <laughs> I mean, you 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 find you 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 might you might begin to have a high blood pressure. Uh, you could even develop an ulcer. You know, so forgiving. I didn't say this, but forgiving is also good for your health. <laughs> um, and and so Ubuntu, Ubuntu really says, if you want to be nice to yourself, start in a way by being nice to the other. Uh, and um, yeah, find your own find, find your own definition of Ubuntu. But it, it, it's wonderful when you think of it as saying, in, 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 in a capsule form, you say, uh, a person is a person through other persons. Now that's not my definition. It's actually what uh, our people say. And, and 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 the highest praise that our people can give you is to say you unabuntu. This person has ubuntu. That's the highest praise when they mean you are generous, you share, you are welcoming, uh, you 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 care about others more than you care for yourself uh, you they would have said it about your yourself yesterday they would have said Ooh, these children have ubuntu so you've given us a lot of really good advice do you have anything particular you want to give us as a group yes. for us to take back to the United States? Well, uh, I would want to say that I, I have a lot of time for young people. And um, when we were struggling against apartheid, I used to, I used to go 
I was one of the few people who could travel, um, and I, I was I was asking for uh, divestment and so forth, and 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 young people, not exclusively, but young people particularly, uh, were amazing. You know, President Reagan. Uh, was firmly opposed to sanctions um, and, and he was hugely popular. So it, it was very difficult to think that your, your Congress would uh, pass uh, the legislation. But I mean, because of the demonstrations, especially by young people, but not, as I said, not exclusively, at colleges and universities, uh, they actually achieved something that was fantastic. They changed the moral climate in the United States, and uh, and uh, Congress not only passed the legislation, but they 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 uh, they, they managed a presidential veto override. Which was which was just amazing, uh, and so I would want to say uh, to you, young people, dream, dream, dream about a a world that uh, that is better than our world, a world where there is no war, uh, a world which says we are not going to be spending billions on instruments of death when a small fraction can ensure that people everywhere have enough to eat, have clean water to drink. Uh, and, and you know, God is forever using, especially young, not oldies like us. God, God likes using young people. Uh, and. Uh, I, I hope that you will be amongst those young people who say we we worked to change to change the world. We worked to make the world a more gentle, a more compassionate, a more caring, a more caring world. Hi? Yes, that is what you can take back. So